Hi, I'm John Lumke, creator of Jazz Cow. You can find me at jazzcow.co.uk or at quirkymotion.com or quirkymotion on social media or John Lumge on social media. You are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening. You're on Two Geeks Talking. is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today from across the pond by a talented creator of an amazing series. He's been in the animation industry far longer than I've been doing this show. We'll dive into his career and his brand new animated series called Jazz Cow. We're joined by the ever-talented John Lumgear. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today. I'm an animation director based in London, and I've been running my company now for 18 plus years. We mainly do stuff for businesses, charities, and government, but we do some entertainment stuff on the side. And we're talking about Jazz Cow. So Jazz Cow is an animated sitcom that I'm launching on Kickstarter later in the year. When I first saw the images, I was immediately drawn to say something along the lines of Rocco's Modern Life or uh, that style of like amazing 90s animation that I grew up with uh, between Batman and, you know, Spider-Man mm. and X-Men and all that stuff. But it was like, this looks like Rocco's Modern Life meets uh, Adventure Time in a certain extent. Like it just had that feel about it. Like it looks like a fun series. Well, hopefully. I mean, it's the, it would definitely, I think we're slightly retro in the way that we approach things. So I'm not surprised that these influences come through. So many people say, oh, it reminds me of this or it reminds me of that. And they're all so different things. So, yeah. Now, let's talk about your, your career. I'm always curious about the animation industry as a whole because I'm not part of it. I don't know anything really about it. So I think the question should be, for those that don't know anything about the animation industry, what is the misconception about the industry? There's probably lots of misconceptions depending on where people are coming from. I think people often have quite a narrow conception of the animation industry, so it's actually incredibly wide. So you've got people doing feature films, TV, spots for businesses. There are people working on games, people working on special effects. So it's an incredibly wide industry, so there are loads and loads of people working in it. So that's probably a misconception that people think it's just one thing. I think... Financially, it's a very strange industry that I think people don't really understand because animation is incredibly hard to make money in. And so a lot of the money comes from merchandise rather than the actual uh, animation films or series actually making money in outright. Mm -hmm. Pixar, which you think, oh, yeah, they, they must be making loads of money, actually make their money on selling software. So they run a a thing called Render Man, or they sell a thing called Render Man, which helps create the images that you see. And that's actually how they make their money. So you've got all sorts of strange, strange ways it works behind the scenes. And I think people also think that animation, they think that computers have taken over and real drawing is dead. But actually, even very, very computer heavy animations, there's usually guys behind the scenes still with pens and pencils. There are a few misconceptions. There's probably more that I'd think of with a bit more time. It's, it's a wonderful industry. We consume it en masse and we probably don't even realize that half the time, uh, you know, you look at series on Netflix with the 3D rendering that is turned into animation. You look at, of course, Studio Ghibli and, and their amazing decades of, of work feels like half mm. a century plus uh, in that respect. And then we look at, of course, Jazz Cow, which is your uh, upcoming series, which I think is an amazing concept in itself. Talk about the conception of how this came to be and let's dive into the Kickstarter campaign and why you need to crowdfund. So I've actually come a little bit prepared this time. <laughs> so it started with a group of us larking around and joking which we'd regularly do me and my housemates many many years ago and we'd actually got this book and we were flicking through and we were looking at various cartoon animals we'd find that they all had the same kind of trajectory where they they'd had some kind of encounter with something that then made them have 
made them have this gift to be able to fight bad guys or whatever. And we thought, well, why is it always those kind of powers you get? Why is it if you get bitten by a spider, you become able to fight bad guys? Why that particular element? And so we thought, well, what about a cow? Why is it always glamorous animals? What kind of power would a cow have? Maybe the power's power jazz. And that's that was the kind of original thing. And we were laughing and joking. And then one of the guys started drawing the characters. And that was the very, very beginning. But then that took time and developed. And we ideas developed over a long period of time. And first it was a little short film that we developed. And then we pitched it to TV stations had some interest from from a couple of stations. One of them asked to see a lot more stuff and we did more work. And then they rebranded, went a completely different direction. So I then put it in a drawer. I was like, oh, okay. So it stayed in a drawer for a few years. James Carey, who's the writer on this, who wasn't at the time, he saw it, he goes, guys, you've got to make this. So I reworked it a bit then. But I had no real avenue to get this out to an audience. It kind of languished a bit. And I met a guy who said, oh, I can get this around streaming services. So he took it around. And people in the streaming services were all kind of had the view that it's hard to take something on that isn't based on existing IP. So if it was a book or a comic or a computer game, they would be potentially interested to develop it. But this is... This is unknown. So he said, well, you could write a book. And I thought, well, there's many books I might want to write, but this really isn't a book. What are we going to do? My writer was like, why don't we try to get it on Kickstarter, raise money and independently make a pilot and then use that pilot to get somewhere. So I thought, I don't really want to do that. I don't like the idea of marketing that stuff. It's a yet another... <laughs> complicated route to get to the end you want to do but then over time i thought yeah this seems to be the right way to do it that's why i kickstarter it's definitely a unique concept i i don't think i've ever seen anything like this on on kickstarter especially from the animated perspective I, i've seen comics not similar to this obviously but anthropomorphic comics uh, and mm. you see things like that but animation is is not really done in this respect so I think you have something there. It has almost a feel of like early, when you look at early Simpsons, how that got onto, got onto the Tracy Allman show and, you know, a, a ragtag group of, of characters that just took the world by storm. You know, I could easily see Jazz Cow kind of filling that, that void that we missed in the 90s. I hope that happens. Just, just for the record, there are really good animations that people have raised money for on Kickstarter. Won't list them now because I will forget some, but... Yeah, you can look up some histories of some pretty great stuff that people have done. Luxa Daisy Cats is the initial one that kind of comes to my mind currently. Spike and, and her amazing Iron Circus crew there too. Looking at the characters of, of course, Jazz Cow, you know, talk to us about the main cast that we have here because I, I don't know if I've included everything in the lower third there or in your title image, but but tell us who we're, we're looking forward to seeing in this series. So Jazz Cow is the main, obviously the main character. And he's a jazz playing cow and he's reluctantly leading the resistance. So all he really wants to do is just sit and play a saxophone and that's it. He's street smart, he's wise, he's he's well educated, and he has this kind of leadership ability that means that people will listen to him. And then you've got his nemesis, who's Dr. Pop, and Dr. Pop wants to make the world a better place. He's not He's not sitting there thinking, I want to make the world evil. He thinks that technology is the way to bring in a kind of utopia. So he's making the world of Pop World cleaner, more efficient, uh, safer. It's all the things that you want, except it's too nice. It doesn't allow freedom. Mm. And, and so the human spirit gets crushed. But his intentions are good. And then in Jazz Cow's band, he's got, well, first he's got his manager, who's also his housemate, they share a bunk bed, who's Denzel, who's a, he's actually a rubbish manager. He couldn't get them any gigs and he doesn't know what he's doing and he doesn't really know about jazz, but he's got a car. He's the only one amongst them that has a car, so he ends up having to drive them everywhere in his little yellow mini. 
in the band you've got Valentina, who's a, a singer. She's she's a Latin American. Jazz Cow and his band live in we call the Bohemian Quarter. And so, but she's in the Latin Quarter. She, she's kind of crossed between two worlds. And she's shy. She's young. She's shy. But she's an incredible singer. Then you've got Papa Moose Brown. And he's the drummer. And he is a total live wire. He's, he's the risk taker when they say, oh, let's do a mission to steal something or a mission to kind of Do do whatever crazy thing. He's always the one that wants to go crazier than the plan and <laughs> would quite happily swing from one building to another or jump on a, on a moving car. And I think that's perfectly ordinary thing to do. Then you've got Pooper Scooper Thompson, who's the bass player, and he is Mr. Argumentative. He will argue. He's just so pedantic. So you've got Another character says they like this style of music and he's like, no, no, the that album was rubbish because it had that player on. When they're driving from one gig to another, they'll say, oh, you know, it's down that street. He's like, no, 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 it's not down that street. It's down that street. That's much faster. He just argues with everybody about everything and anything. And then you've got Pudding Face Cedric, who's the keys player. He's a quiet one. Seems like he's a kind of radical guy, but he's actually into his kind of his secret knitting circle. He's that kind of wise, quiet guy that doesn't say a lot, but when he says it, it's important. And then you've got Connie. She, she runs the jazz club where Jazz Cow's resident at. Her husband was a gangster. He was involved in some dodgy stuff. And she's like a, a hard lady, but she's really like kind to jazz musicians. There are a few of the characters. I could keep going on, but <laughs> it's I've, I've realized I've been going on a lot. <laughs> no, no, no. But this is something that we need to know about because while the Kickstarter, I'm sure, will highlight it, if they don't kind of hear about the characters, then they're not going to really be able to relate with these characters either. Mm. That's why I always ask about a cast because there's always something that you can you'll trigger in your mind that will actually come up and, and say, oh yeah, I remember it's about this character and this. And it'll just mm. help us make that connection. You know, you've mentioned the characters, but if you could briefly tell us each uh, each character's one strength and one weakness. Mm. Dr. Pop's strength is that he a visionary. His weakness is that he thinks he knows how to run other people's lives. Mm. Jazz Cow's strength is he he's got great leadership abilities, and actually without him. All the band just fall into arguing with one another. They they do need him as a kind of figurehead to hold them together. And his weakness is he he needs a bit of a kick to get going. <laughs> Denzel's strength is he's enthusiastic. His weakness is that he's clueless. <laughs> Papa Moose's strength is that he is he's fearless and he's he's very fatherly to some of the characters. But he's also, um, he's a bit stupid because he just takes ridiculous risks. Pooper Scooper's um, strength is that he's really details oriented person. But his weakness is he just argues with everybody and he's just stupidly pedantic. Pudding Face's strength is he's wise, but I, I'm not really sure what his weakness is. Probably that he doesn't speak up early enough. Yeah, the last one would be the uh, the bar, the lady owner of the bar. Oh yes, yeah, she's her strength is that she she's really kind, but her weakness is that she because she's so kind she don't, they don't make any money, or certainly she doesn't make any money legitimately anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sometimes, especially if you've been working on a series, sometimes you and your character development, you, you, you're focused more on the animation side of things rather than what are their traits. But even though I'm sure you have character bios, but it's always interesting to hear, you know, a, a creator's thoughts and views uh, on a per character basis. It's quite funny because I know them quite well, all these different characters. Well, I know them very well, all these different characters. And asked me a few years ago, and I probably would have been crisper. Mm. But now they've developed a lot more. They, they've. But I guess it's like, it's like describing real people. Then they start. How many episodes is the series going to be? Or are you just focusing on like an initial animation pilot, mm. or, or is it like an eight eight episode mini arc? So we're raising money for the pilot, mm. and which is a heist um, episode, and then we've got about we've got about half a dozen. 
like breakdowns of episodes that are not they don't exist as a script and so if we could get this pilot made then we would use it to try and get more and we've got a lot of other ideas that we could keep going with so it's it could potentially run and run and run but at the moment it's just getting this the pilot off the ground so the Kickstarter campaigns, if you've run a campaign, you understand how much work that goes into it. If you've never run a Kickstarter campaign, it's like a second or third job. There's so much you have to go into it, so much detail. What are some of the levels or perks that we can pick up in regards to this particular campaign? Because that that's what really draws people in besides the mm. amazing content you have. Currently, and the, this is being tweaked behind the scenes and I'm getting feedback from different people, but they fall into the the film itself. So the 20 minute episode, which people would get to be able to stream, and then that gets kind of upgraded to that with all the extra features, uh, that with kind of production diary of the whole thing. So you get to see every everything behind the scenes. Then you've got the Art of Book, which uh, digital and then physical and physical one with, you know, signed and all that kind of stuff. And then we've got experience-based stuff. So visiting the recording studio. I mean, that would be only for people who are UK-based or someone that doesn't mind paying for a flight. <laughs> yeah, there are a few other things off the top of my head. It's quite hard to know. I've got a very, very long spreadsheet with lists of things. And it's quite hard to know which things to include, which things not to. So things go in and out of the list a bit. I'm yeah. sure once it's finalized, it'll have like maybe five or six tiers at most. And then it's just a little easier for people to go through and, and select what they need. Exactly. It's weird because there's a add-ons function yep. and I was playing with it, but it does the add-on to everything. And it's like really annoying interface. I was screaming at the interface the other day. <laughs> I just couldn't get it to work. And I was showing it to my wife and going, why is this not doing what it says on the help page? And then I, I messaged... I messaged Kickstarter. They got back to me really quickly just saying, oh, yeah, it's broken. And they fixed it. Well, at least they fixed it. That's the main thing. Instead yeah, they just... were really good at fixing it quickly as well. So that was encouraging. Because Jazz Cow is jazzy, <laughs> <laughs> what type of soundtracks are you thinking of putting into it? Or is that going to be like the common theme throughout this episode and future episodes? I can't announce it yet, but I've got a number of musicians that hopefully should come on board that are legit jazz musicians and in the uk there's quite an exciting jazz scene actually at the moment so we want to tap into that this is not a show if you hate jazz you'd still love the show put it that way so it's not going to be trying to showcase the weirdest end of the freest jazz that will just make people's head explode if they don't like jazz but it's going to have a a jazzy soundtrack i mean it's hard to talk about it's hard to talk about this without name name dropping the people that I can't name drop yet. But we've got on the team that should be happening, well respected guy that's um kind of more straight ahead jazz, but in an accessible, accessible kind of sound. Then we've got some guys that have played more with the slightly more dancey kind of stuff. But yeah, it'll be a completely original soundtrack. The music is to serve the comedy. And so if you watch an episode of The Simpsons, you've got that wonderful Danny Elfman introduction. But then during the episode, there's it's just used to heighten the the comedy or the the emotion at certain points. So it's yeah, it is the servant of the comedy. It definitely sounds interesting for myself. I I kind of got into jazz because my, my dad likes jazz but he also likes r&b and he likes whatever mm. else and so it's like a i had a mix and, and rock and roll obviously zeppelin and, and things like that but so i had a, a wide eclectic uh mix of music growing up and then i ended up playing clarinet in the school band so you know uh that kind of paved the way for my thing so i under i appreciate jazz for the sake of jazz but if you go too avant-garde with the jazz then you just completely completely lose people and it's just one of those things where it's like they'll mute the audio just so that they can see the, the picture. <laughs> yeah. We're not, we're not going to, unless that is part of the plot at some point, okay. that's not where we're going. There is going to be some musical jokes in there, which 
if you get the music, that's a nice level. But if you don't, then you're they'll just wash you by and it's fine. So if you're scared of jazz, don't worry, it's not gonna bite. <laughs> <laughs> You may skiddly boob up uh, your way to the grocery store, but you know, you'll still enjoy it either way, right? Exactly. <laughs> I was just gonna ask actually about hidden references and, and jokes. You know, I'm I'm sure you're you're gonna filter in some Easter eggs throughout this. Is there any mm. initial Easter eggs or little like nods to certain things, uh, like maybe hidden in the animation or maybe hidden in sound design? Yeah, there will there will be. I mean, so I've actually uh, recently written an article that's going to come up very soon on an animation blog about jazz as use in um, soundtracks and uh, animation soundtracks. And one of the interesting things is the use of quotation. So jazz musicians will often, when they're improvising, will quote another piece of music, and that can often be a little. A little bit of an Easter egg for someone that you you sit in Tom and Jerry, you'll watch something, and there's some of the music is hinting at something else, and that's quite fun. So we do a lot of that. Um, yeah, just within designs of backgrounds or names of books, we've got lots of books in this episode, and so there'll be some jokes in the books. Just yeah, there'll be Easter eggs scattered throughout. It's just the way. Yeah, you can't not do it really. <laughs> It's too fun. <laughs> it's like, how many times can you watch an episode and catch all the Easter eggs? You win a, a special thanks in our next credits. There you go. <laughs> or maybe <laughs> maybe if they can guess all the Easter eggs in an episode, once the campaign funds, uh, maybe the next episode they become a background character or something like that. That's quite fun. One of the, one of the things I find interesting with spotting Easter eggs is I'm sure that some people spot Easter eggs that weren't even put there by the people originally. What what does this mean? I saw these three <laughs> colors that look similar to this thing that I know and love. Is this in, is this in the next episode? Oh my god! <laughs> I find it funny when a celebrity or something does something with their hands, and you know people are moving their hands about all the time when they speak, and then. Someone will take like a freeze frame of a moment and they'll say, ah, oh, that hand signal is secretly, I don't know, it's the Illuminati or something. <laughs> like, oh, come on. <laughs> How did they know? Quick, <laughs> change hand signals. <laughs> when it comes to episodes, especially when it comes to a pilot, you have a very limited window to draw people's attention in, and especially in today's age with how fast technology is, how fast we consume our medium. What is the first couple of minutes that you can talk about in your pilot that will draw people in? That's such a good question. I think the first, it's going to be the, I mean, it's actually the title sequence. I haven't really thought very deeply about the title sequence. <laughs> Partly because there's been discussions with musicians about it and there's something that, yeah, I had quite a fun all about that the other day you've slightly stumped me with that question yeah ask, ask me nearer the time the the reason i ask is if we're, if we're looking at classic animations whether they're north american or whether they're uh, european based or, or or even japanese or asian those types of animated intros that we all know and love whatever genre that we're into you know that just draws people in it's it's not even like the first 30 seconds of a lead into the intro itself. It's just something that we will stop and watch it no matter what it is, whether it's the Simpsons intro, because we're looking for what Easter eggs are they putting in that quick introduction? What's what's Bart writing on the wall? We look at the Looney Tunes or we look at Animaniacs or we look at uh, any Japanese animation has a massive two minute introduction with rocking music or whatever it is. And they're introducing all the characters without saying their names. It's just like, it's like, how are you going to not top those, but how are you going to either pay homage to what your inspirations are with jazz call itself? I think it's kind of the thought process is how I would go into it. If I were designing it. The answer is, I don't quite know. I was talking to musicians the other day and saying, I envisage it a, like walking through the Bohemian Quarter where Jazz Cow lives, but that wasn't necessarily what would be in the visuals, but I was just talking about the kind of soundscape of that world. But 
yeah, we're not we're not there yet. So uh, fair enough. It's a good question. Oh, I, I, good. thanks. You, you mentioned the Bohemian Quarter. I I don't know anything about the Bohemian Quarter. Yeah. What I mean, the only thing I could think of would be there's a a quarter in Toronto that's very artistic or very, and very creative. But what is the Bohemian Quarter in in England or in London? I don't think there is. London is constantly shifting. It's a battle between gentrification and artists because the problem is that it's as London's become ridiculously gentrified, it's become really, really expensive to live mm -hmm. and artists don't earn very much money and artists, the people that make it interesting, create all the stuff that the rich people want to live there. So there's a, this kind of constant churn so i don't and i think london has really suffered from that for the last five years particularly i think they've there isn't a particular area of london that i would say oh yeah that is the bohemian quarter i mean in jazz cow it's it serves as a bit like vichy france so mm. it's not quite so you've got the dominating world of pop world which dr pop doesn't run you actually have the mayor runs it but she's in his pocket and and it's like a semi-autonomous kind of region that is being engulfed by um, Pop World. So like Vichy France or that the little bit they have at the beginning of Asterix where they, the, the ghoulish, ghoulish, is that the word you use for the ghouls? The ghoul people yeah. are like um, engulfed by Rome. Um, but yeah, in London, I'm not sure where we'd have it. It's hard when you're trying to, when, when a city is evolving to the point of from like the 19th century, I'm sure there's not a lot of historical areas because everything is trying to be updated to a more populist standard. And then you have, like I said, the artistic communities are, are in small pockets throughout and struggling to survive. Like every creative person is, it feels in the, in the world doesn't necessarily mean London, but I was going to say London's London's interesting because it's, although it's one city, you've got the square mile, which is is what we call the city, and then you've got the rest of London. But London was made up of little villages, historically. And so each neighbourhood has a very, very different feel. And that history still exists, and you've got a kind of layering. So you see old buildings, and then you've got more modern, more modern, and it's always in that that change. And you can just see, so Brixton, which is far from me, you can see a big, what you'd call a ghost, a ghost um, poster or something that's painted on one of the walls. And I think it's an old Victorian poster, but it's it's no longer. It's just, you can see just the remnants of it, and you see the remnants of the different people that have lived there over time. And I think that's quite interesting. I like walking around my area and just seeing the history that's just beneath the surface of a lot of things. So that always makes something interesting. There's a kind of visual architecture, a visual archaeology, I guess. Are there any underlying messages or themes that you hope viewers will latch on to as they're watching the pilot and that may extend into future episodes? I'm nervous about too much in the way of messaging, just because we're in a world where with all the culture wars and so much propaganda. And so I'm kind of sick of that. So I don't want this to ever be a show where you are being lectured to, but there are themes in it. it it's, it's created by humans. And the big, the big theme at the center of it is the battle between big tech and algorithms kind of controlling and then freedom. How do you live in the kind of contrast between those worlds? Because Jazz Cow's guys are pushing for freedom. They want they want to be creative. They want to do their own thing. But their place is full of disorder and madness. And then you've got the very ordered pop world, which I'm clearly not on the same side as. <laughs> you know, underneath it all, people are spending far too much time looking at screens, mm. all the doom scrolling, all of what big tech is actually doing to people is is not healthy. And so I guess the message of go out, 
spend time with friends, invest in real relationships with people, have friendships, play a musical instrument, go and paint a painting. Just don't spend your time staring at a tiny little screen like and just endlessly scrolling. You'll be happier for it. That's probably, I guess, the big theme. But if someone really wants to do that, they're free to do that. Go touch grass, basically. Go outside. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice that you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? I knew you were going to ask this because you've asked you've asked other people this. And I thought I should really think of a wise answer to say to this. And I and I haven't. Um be prepared. Um, <laughs> <laughs> second most useful piece of advice. Yeah, I, I wouldn't even know what the first is. And I've had uh, people ask me the first as well. Mm. And I think every time people ask me, I give a different answer, which uh, <laughs> I'd probably say stick at stuff, keep working at things. But I, yeah, I don't know. I find these, these kind of questions impossible to answer. Oh, geez, then you're not going to like my last four. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask me anything. Don't worry. <laughs> what was an early experience where language had power? Okay, here's, here's, a, really, here's a really weird one. When I was about eight years old, I think it was about eight years old, um, I was, I heard someone reading an Anglo-Saxon poem called The Dream of the Rude, which is, rude is the old Anglo-Saxon word for cross. And I remember hearing the language of it and it's beautiful poem, beautiful Anglo-Saxon poem. And the in images it was conjuring up in my mind and thinking, oh, the language itself carries meaning, not just the definition of, sort of the words, if that makes sense. There's a beauty to language itself. I was definitely under 10. And I was probably, probably about eight or nine. There's something when, when you have a, a person reading or whether you're listening to an audio book and they're actually engrossed in what they're consuming and what they're telling you, even though it's a job, it's sometimes the passion of whatever they're reading just kind of filters through and it, it excites you and makes mm. it thoughtful. And, and that's the one thing that we lose in not con conversing with people. And that's why I keep doing this show so I can actually continue to, to talk <laughs> and to mm. actually have conversations with people from all over the world and to understand what they're passionate about and what they're doing. And I, and I think that with, with jazz cow, and I think with everything that you've done in, in your career, it's just, you know, one more person that, you know, I want to keep following in, in their career and seeing what they're going to do next, which means that you have to come back on more than one time. So there you go. <laughs> I'd be up for that. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? I can't believe you give me questions that were for Stanley. I feel I'm not in that league. Um, probably my dad. Yeah, I'd say my dad. So my dad was very encouraging in me pursuing artistic things, or so was my mum. But I think, yeah, I'll say my dad. I remember um, I was drawing and I wasn't happy with my drawing and kept screwing up paper. And my mum was like, no, no, it's really good. And my dad was like, no, if he, if he wants to push for it to be better, he should. I guess it was that thing of wanting to push to be good rather than just resting on my laurels. From a professional standpoint, you have created, of course, you've been in the animation industry for many years. You've created many works that we haven't had a chance to talk about that we will in the future, I'm sure, because I want you to come back on your you're, we're just scratching the, the surface that is, of course, you know, John here. So from a professional standpoint, you are successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? No. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's an interesting quote. I think it was G.K. Chesterton said that um, you can tell what a culture values by um, what we 
mean by the word success because success a goat is successful at being a goat and so success often carries a whole load of things around money and status and i don't have either so in any kind of sense i don't think i would be considered successful by many because i don't have money or status but in terms of i am doing more or less what i want to do so that's a form of success but i'd like to do more of my own stuff and be completely independent so that would be a greater level of success the reverse of success is failure how do you deal with your failures i've got used to failing rather a lot i don't think i take myself too seriously and i do expect that failure is part of the course of life well recently i felt like i had a bit of a failure with this kickstarter campaign that a number of elements were coming together and it looked like we were on course to meet our goal and then i had a whole load of things happen at the same time that meant that that wasn't going to be the case and i basically put back the launch date and that felt like a failure and felt incredibly frustrating yeah the next morning you get back on the bike and you work out what are the next steps and so i guess yeah i guess it's not holding not not languishing in any kind of failure but getting up and keeping going fail try get up try again what's that batman phrase from michael kane you know why do we why do we fall so we can pick ourselves back up yeah there's my influence is coming through <laughs> well yeah and you think the right the writer themselves that wrote wrote that line or whoever wrote that line is probably coming from their own experience when they wrote it. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired by creative in their own way, whether it's in animation, maybe it's cartooning, maybe it's something along the creative path that you've inspired them. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? They should push themselves to do stuff that no one has done and seek to be truthful. So I think there's always pressures, societal pressures and stuff around us that tells us we should make things or say things that conform to what the societal norms around us are but i think if you want to create stuff that's going to last beyond you you need to tell the truth from how you see it and be completely honest i think honesty is i think honesty is where longevity comes from sometimes it's hard to be honest especially with pressures of society in itself Oh, totally, totally. And you need to be wise as well with it. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you have to have a filter when you speak? Oh, man. Yeah, I don't have one of them, which yeah. gets me into trouble. <laughs> uh, if your life was a film or TV series, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? So my life is not over yet. And I'm hoping that we'll get somewhere more exciting with a title than, than anything I'd come up come up with now. Something like he had a go. <laughs> he failed rather a lot, but not always. <laughs> something, something, something like that. I don't know. I struggle. I totally struggle with that. And soundtrack wise, probably a kind of a big mix of different things using a 1950s blue note kind of sound. Thelonious Monk, who's a jazz musician that I'm a big fan of with his kind of off kilter childlike sound i can imagine featuring a bit of bach that would be good i guess it depends on the scene well john i do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking i want to thank you so much for being on the show thank you before i let you go where can we find you how can we support you of course where is jazz cow and when does the campaign end and everything along that line you can find all the jazz cow stuff at jazzcow.co.uk and there you can subscribe to the mailing list or you can find the link to the Kickstarter to be notified when it launches. You can also search for Jazz Cow on Kickstarter. And I think we haven't got the exact dates out yet We because we had to rejig the dates. But we'll be launching in autumn. And so it'll be sometime in autumn that it will begin and end. We're thinking maybe August to November type deal, something like that. 
Yeah, probably mid September to mid October. Okay. If you go on social media and search for the handle Quirky Motion, Q U I R K Y M O T I O N, you can find a lot of stuff there or search for my name, John Lumgair, L U M G A I R. That's probably the best the best places to go. And my website is quirkymotion.com, which is my company. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and 1,200 plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O, not the number two, but website is going through a complete revamp. So go to our YouTube channel. That is always updated because I am only one person. YouTube.com forward slash TGT Media. The podcast you can find at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell except to me to bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.